campaign for 2024 is taken from Acts chapter 18, verse 26. Knowledge is never wisdom until it is shared. CSCF Midweek Bible Study this Wednesday, February 14th at 7 o'clock p.m. via Zoom, Facebook Live, and CSCF website with our instructor, Bishop Dr. Pamela S. Jackson. There is a word from the Lord on prayer just for you. And Ray Citadel First Ladies Day Fashion Show will be held on this Saturday, February 17th at 2 o'clock p.m. here at Citadel Bay. We want you to be a model. There will be the black scene, the floral scene, the white scene, and the purple scene. And each model is asked to donate $5 per scene to participate. All genders and ages are welcome. Invite your friends and family to come see you strut down the runway. A donation of $10 for this event is greatly appreciated. Then on Sunday, February 18th, we will continue the celebration with First Ladies Day at 12 o'clock p.m. in the fellowship hall at 2.30 p.m. Annual day assessment is $25 per member. Elder Dr. Tumoji Jackson is the coordinator of the weekend of honoring Bishop Dr. Pamela S. Jackson as she celebrates her 64th birthday on February 20th. Please be reminded that we need pure cushion sponsors as we launch fundraisers to cover the entire cost of replacing all of the cushions in the sanctuary. Each pure cushion is $100 our goal is $2,500. Please see me if you would like to sign up to be a cushion sponsor. Join us for Open Door Prayer Ministry every Wednesday at 6 o'clock a.m. led by Elder Christine Michael. The call-in number is 267-807-9605. The access code is 548-514 followed by the panel sign. Don't forget, the church that prays together, stays together. Our prayer focus for the week is Sherry Green and Shakora McIntosh. Let's extend our hands to them and say, My sisters, My sisters we, are we are praying for you this week, this week and always. Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading for the week is Psalm chapter 139 and 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Please remember to submit all announcements in writing via email to sean.bolton at gmail.com by Thursday at 5 o'clock p.m. in order to be presented during Sunday services and rebroadcast all week long on our website at www.citadelfaith.net. Now we would like to recognize and say happy birthday to our February babies. Minister Kristen Tucker, February 3rd. Cornerstone University, 
Ebony Alpha Ebony Service Organization, and Citadel of Faith Christian Fellowship. Thank you for sharing with us in worship and consider yourself one of the family whenever you cross our threshold. Grace and peace multiply. Black History Month was created in 1926 in the United States when historian Carter Godwin Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History announced the second week of February to be Negro History Week. Since the 1890s, black communities celebrated the birthdays of two people considered to have a big impact on black history in the United States, Abraham Lincoln, February 12th. The American president that issued a preliminary emancipation proclamation that declared all enslaved people be forever freed in 1863. And Frederick Douglass, February 14th. After escaping slavery, he became a national leader of the abolitionist movement to end slavery and famous for his anti-slavery writings. <laughs> In 1915, Woodson traveled to Washington, D.C. to participate in a national celebration of the nationwide emancipation. He was inspired by experiences from his trip to create an organization to promote the study of black life and history. Soon after, he helped to form what is now known as the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. This association in 1926 sponsored a National Negro History Week. Choosing the second week of February to coincide with Lincoln and Douglas's birthday. This inspired schools and communities nationwide to organize events to celebrate. The first Negro History Week was met with a lukewarm response. Gaining the cooperation of the Department of Education of the states of North Carolina, Delaware and West Virginia, as well as the city school administrations of Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Woodson felt that at least one week would allow for the general movement to become something annually celebrated. He realized the subject needed to resonate with a greater audience. Woodson contended that the teaching of black history was essential to ensure the physical and intellectual survival of the race. If a race has no history, it has no worthwhile tradition. It becomes an unimportant factor in the world, and it stands in danger of being exterminated. By 1929, with only two exceptions, officials with the state departments of education of every state with considerable black population made the event known to the teachers and distributed official literature. Churches also played a significant role in the distribution of literature, with the black press aiding in the publicity act. Throughout the 1930s, Negro History Week countered the growing myth of the lost cause of the Confederacy that blacks were better off under slavery. When you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions, with the wrong history, the miseducation of the Negro. You do not have to tell him not to stand here or go behind him. He will find his proper place and will stay in him. Throughout the following decades, Negro history grew in popularity, with mayors across the United States endorsing it as a holiday. History Month was first proposed by black educators and the black United States student at Kent State University in February 1969. The first celebration of Black History Month took place at Kent State one year later, from 1969 to 1970. 
from January 2nd to February 28th in 1970. By 1976, Black History Month was being celebrated all across the country when President Gerald Ford recognized the month during the celebration of the United States Bicentennial. He urged Americans seize the opportunity to honor the two often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. Black History Month is observed in the United States and Canada in February. Ireland, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom celebrate in October. On February 22nd, 2016, a 106-year-old Washington, D.C. resident and school volunteer, Virginia McLaurin, visited the White House as part of Black History Month. When asked by President Obama why she was there, McLaurin said,
Jackson. The Spirit of the Lord is in this place. For the Spirit of the Lord is. There it is. gospel is recorded by Matthew, and we'll go to chapter 17, and as you turn there, I want to invite your attentions to verses 1 through 7, Matthew 17, verses 1 through 7, and you've heard the scripture rendering from the New King James Version. And I want to give special attention and emphasis to the second verse. And the second verse of that text says, And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. My friends, the preliminary to this great event called the Transfiguration of our Lord has to also do has to also connect to the epiphany of the apostle. For in chapter 16, we go up to a place called Caesarea Philippi, so named for Philip, the king of Macedon, and for Caesar, the emperor of the Roman Empire. Caesarea Philippi is an outlayer of Judea because it was not Jewish territory. Even though it was in Judea, it was a place that Herod had established for a port to receive supplies coming from the south in Egypt coming from the east uh, in Cyprus, coming from the north from Asia Minor. Caesarea Philippi was a busy place, and it was a place where there was not an established Jewish house of worship. So Jesus takes his apostles into Caesarea Philippi outside of the comfort zone, outside of Jewish territory, because a revelation will take place in Caesarea Philippi that would be dangerous to have taken place in Judea. Okay. For as they walk through that territory, and Jesus is teaching, he's instructing, as, they walk in, as they're walking together, going deeper into the territory, he stops to ask them a question. He takes a survey and he says, who do men say that I am? And there are several answers that come out from among this entourage. Now my friends, this is not just the apostles, but this is the disciples. Okay, yes. and when we talk about the disciples, we are always talking about a larger group than the apostles. Okay. Please keep in mind that you can be a disciple without being an apostle. Mm -hmm. But you can't be an apostle. You can't be an apostle without being a disciple. Okay. So as they walk along, he takes this, uh, he gives out this survey, this questionnaire. And the responses come back with some say that you are John the Baptist, raised from the dead. Others say that you are that great prophet of Tishbe, Elijah. I'm sure there were other answers. There were a lot of people there, a lot of opinions. <laughs> In this room, uh, among us, 
I'm sure that if we all read the same text, we'll still come up with different approaches and different opinions and different interpretations because we have different personalities. So who do you say? I know that the people are saying, I know what the crowd is saying. I'm even aware of what my enemies are saying. I, I know what my haters are saying. And Jesus really wasn't concerned about what the haters were saying because the haters are going to be the haters. And too many times we get caught up in what folks who don't like us think about us. Let me go ahead and talk to you. A lot of times, podium, we care about folks who don't the opinions of people who don't care about us. Amen. As if they have some kind of influence over us. Like if they run something or make decisions. Look, if you know somebody don't like you, don't expect them to say nice things about you. You can set yourself up for all the things you say. But that was another sermon. Let's go back here. So Jesus says, well, who do you got? Say I am. You've been walking with me for three years now. You've been sitting at my table. I have blessed your households. I fed you when you were hungry. I even clothed you when you were naked. Who do you say that I am? One of the apostles speaks up. And this apostle who speaks up was formerly known as Simon. That's his given name. In fact, Jesus meets him in Matthew chapter 3. His brother Andrew right. introduces him to Jesus. And Jesus, at that point, says something to him prophetically that we can't overlook. He says to him, Thou art Simon. But thou shall be Peter. That's good. What that says to us, church, is that we are all in process. Let me talk here to See, often play, we are all on the way to being Peter, but many of us are still stuck in time. Uh, go somebody. And you know, you remember that game we were growing up named Simon Says? Uh, you know, kids today, all their games have to be you know, computerized, electronic. We used to actually play physical games. Uh, but see, Simon Says, uh, turn around, and then you turn around. Yeah. Simon Says, back up, then you back up. But when you say, now back up, Simon say if Simon didn't say that, you had to go all the way back to the beginning and start over. Because you see, this game Simon Says was about dictating to people what they can and can't do. That was the point. That was the point. Are you listening to my dictation? You're doing what I'm telling you to do. Well, my friends, if you're still playing Simon Says, you'll never break free from your blessing. Because you're going to still always be stuck on what somebody tells you to do. transition from Matthew chapter 3 to chapter 16. And in chapter 16, Simon makes this declaration, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Amen. And Jesus almost marvels at this because he remembered when the guy started. <laughs> When folks look at your beginning, when they look at your point of departure, when they look at where you started from, many times they can't believe how far you have come and what you have done to get to this new place because they so were accustomed to you being in the back of the line. You know what? Sometimes we allow them that, that luxury because we don't press them and we don't push them. But when God moves us forward, when God gets us in position, they'll say, wow. Yes. You're no longer Simon. Uh -huh. Because heaven has spoken into your spirit. Uh -huh. And 
you were able to not only hear, but to interpret what came from heaven. In other words, your prophetic gift just kicked in. And we thought that you were just playing. But now your prophecy has come to pass. And now you have transitioned and graduated. You are no longer signing.
they'll talk to him. So Jesus, Jesus, let me get back to the other sermon now. So Jesus Jesus takes the circle in the circle, the inner circle. You know what I'm talking about? The real, real close homes. And they go up on Mount Horeb. And when they get up to the lofty heights of Mount Horeb, Jesus steps away, and when he does, he just changes. They're going up the hill with him, and they get to this particular peak, this point of destination, and Jesus steps off, and all of a sudden, he changes. And when he changes, following the word in verse 2, this just caught my attention. When he got, in verse 2, it says he was transfigured. He was messed up. <laughs> he was disfigured. When, when, when we say transfigured, he came out of himself. He underwent a metamorphosis. Do you all remember in science, when, when we were in the science class and they talked about the caterpillar? Yeah. And the caterpillar just crawling on, crawling on, and you get up on the leaf and he starts to weed this cocoon and it's just ugly, it's just unpleasant to see, but he gets in that cocoon and then about four weeks later, that wing starts to come. Of that cocoon. You see, you sometimes got to go through a displeasing state. You got to go through an unfortunate era. You got to go through an ugly time to get to your metamorphosis. He was transfigured in front of them. What happened, my friends, is that this thing called in Incarnation. Say that with me. Incarnation. Incarnation comes from a Latin word incarnate. And it really means to be turned inside out. Jesus. My friends, up on the Mount of Transfiguration, his insides showed up on his outside. What do you mean? His face turned into sunshine. His clothes were bright like the light. You see, there was something on the inside that worked its way to the outside. All the time, he was walking around with them. All the time, he was sitting down having dinner with them. All the time, he was at the campfire teaching them. God was inside of him. He had all this God in him. And when he got to the lofty heights of Mount Horeb, his God came out. He couldn't hold it any longer. He had to get to a place where everybody couldn't see him. He had to get to a lofty place because they couldn't have understood. They would have lost their mind if he had to show them the God in him. So he had to go way up somewhere. And when he went way up on the mountain, God in him came out of him. Something on the inside. Finally worked his way to the outside and it just burst like light. And when the apostles saw it, they fell on their face because they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to think. They had not planned. They were not expecting such a spectacle. And it was so severe that God had to send messengers from heaven. Hallelujah. He had to send witnesses from heaven. And as he stood there with his God self showing, stood there with his incarnation exposed, Moses showed up the lawgiver, and Elijah showed up the prophetic message. 
Elijah. Because between them, Jesus was the link. Jesus was the book. Jesus was the tie that tied them from heaven to earth. The tie that tied the Old Testament to the New Testament. He was the tie that tied the law to the prophecy, to the fulfillment. Because you see, there was something on the inside. My friends, when, when you're going through chaos, when you're going through trial, when you're going through tears and tribulation, but you don't fall apart. You don't give up. You don't go in the time. You don't start cussing and fussing. But you lift your eyes to the hill. That's because there's something on the inside. When they lied on you and ridiculed you and stabbed you in the back. And you didn't go get your pistol out the pocket of your mouth. You know what that was? That work its way to the outside. When your money get funny and you got more money than you got bills, but you don't give up and you don't compromise your integrity, and the Lord bring you through and you come out better than before. That's because you got something on the inside that's working to the outside. When everybody tell you that you ought to quit.
bear me up. Thank you, Lord. That's good. Thank you, Jesus. That's good. That's good. Thank you, Lord. That's good. I don't need you to help me. I'm just thinking about myself. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. You made a way. Oh, glory. You made a way. You made a way. Oh, Holy Ghost. Something on the inside. God bless you today. And God smiles upon you. Grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. If you don't mind praising, go ahead and take a praise break. Right? Hallelujah. Thank the Lord for the little folks that they come here. 